Every time we say capitalism, take one shot. Every time we say <laughs> class war, take two. I, I find being called a self-hating Jew a little bit funny at this point. Because I don't think we are just out there on the internet performing ourselves for clicks because we're addicted. I think that we're doing it because we're terrified of being left behind. Uh, we are in the haunted chapel uh, at my place right now. We're going to have a really wonderful conversation tonight. I'm looking forward to this one immensely. All part of Strombo's Lit, our book club that we do with Apple Books. Uh, the reason I started the book club is because I saw my attention span and felt it completely diminish, like completely diminish screen time, scrolling, buying shirts I don't need on Instagram, going, hey, why don't I sell everything and move to, I don't know, get a boat in a river in England or whatever. The point being, my attention span was gone. So I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to do some more stuff here and, uh, and, and, and build my attention span back at reading books was a crucial part of why I got into this business in the first place. Uh, so that's why we started it. Nick at Apple Books has been amazing. Social media is still key for what we do here at Strombo. This YouTube channel has been a lot of fun. Um, it's been a lot of fun, which is great. I think we've got Naomi ready to go, right? I think we've got uh, Naomi ready to go. Let's see if we can uh, bring Naomi in right now. This is going to be lovely. Hi there. How are you? I'm I'm very good. It's so good to see you, George. So Thanks nice for having me. Yeah. It's been a long time. Uh, I think the last time was when you joined us on the Red Chair show back in the day. I was just thinking about that red chair. Yeah, <laughs> this is much more relaxed. It's I just totally... get my, my red office <laughs> in a, having a cozy snow day in British Columbia. Absolutely. Uh, school was canceled and it was just super, super fun to just be home today. What's a, how much snow and how cold does it have to be for snow to get for school to get canceled in BC? Oh my gosh. Um, like this much, like That's you're, it. you know, BC. <laughs> like people just, they call it, it's, it's snowmageddon, you know, it's really not. <laughs> Thing by by Ontario standards, but uh, the roads go the ro the roads aren't safe, and everyone got a snow day. There you go. The book here, yeah. Doppelganger. Uh, I love the cover. I love the title. It says a trip into the mirror world. Um, but what's pretty amazing about it is that, and even though you have done, you know, written about your personal life in the past, th this mirror world in a way is your life in 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 with a kind of view that we don't normally get to see. And I just want to. You're no fool. So it's a very conscious choice to do mm -hmm. this and write about this. Walk me through your thinking. <laughs> um, well, the book is, yeah, if, if, if people have read earlier books of mine, you know, like The Shock Doctrine or This Changes Everything about climate change, those are very serious, very linear books. You know, they're the type of book that put their sort of thesis argument up front and tells you the journey that you're going to go on. And then you climb up that mountaintop collecting facts and, and bolstering the argument. And then once you get to the top, you, you, you say, okay, here, this is how we got here. And, and, and then you're done. This, this is a much more circuitous journey. Um, it, it's really, honestly, it was more, it came out of a desire to play with voice and to to write it, it's much more creative nonfiction yeah. than those than those other books i was i worked with a, a writing teacher deep in the pandemic i just thought well i can't go anywhere um <laughs> you know i lead uh, i have ten, i have tended to lead like you a, a pretty travel heavy life and never in one spot for for, mm -hmm. for long enough to do something like take a course you know um and i thought well, I'm stuck, so maybe I'll take a writing course. And I ended up working with a, a writing teacher one-on-one -on -one and just playing with fiction and dialogue in different ways. And then it occurred to me that the fact that I have a doppelganger, uh, somebody who I am have been perennially confused with uh, for many, many years now, was an interesting way into the fact that I think a lot of us are confused about who the person is who represents us online to the world. Like right. when we have an avatar, that's a doppelganger. When you create a personal sort of curated brand that other people think is you, but you know is not really you, it's just the you that you want them to think you are. Right. Um, or when AI can create doppelgangers of us without our consent, like I just thought, <laughs> this is very rich. Like, and so, so... It is personal, um, and it's also more experimental, right? As as a kind of writing, so it was a blast to write, honestly. Uh, until it turned into being about fascism and <laughs> and 
something that, like you know i mean it's more it became more like a jordan peele horror movie right? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what got to me uh and i was talking about this today the the further i got into the book the more i went there it is there it is we're coming right back to this because because no, I, mean, I don't think you can avoid canadian, it george, uh, uh, to bring another canadian into the conversation i had this like leonard cohen in my head going you want it darker <laughs> and that was just well, you got it darker, you know, mm-hmm. but, but I think it's like I said off the top when we were waiting for people to come on board, uh, the darkness is not a reason to avoid it. Um, it's, it's, you know, I've attended tons of conferences and talked to tons of people in the AI space and they say that we're asking often the wrong questions or afraid of the wrong things, but we have to be in the conversation. We have to get into it to understand where we are as a culture. Um, the, the journey of trying to to do it this way is different. And you took the writing course. And I know that you're a confident person. At least you present confidently lots of times. I wondered, were you confident as you settled in to do this? So for folks who haven't read the book, it is, you know, it does, it it, it is definitely a departure. I do present I, as you know, very serious nonfiction writer. And this book has scenes where I'm, you know, doing yoga before bed and uh, my partner, Avi Lewis, walks in and is like, is it really okay to listen to Steve Bannon while in pigeon pose? Like, doesn't one undo the other? Yeah, that's not <laughs> but, one of know, the eight like, limbs. That's not one of the eight limbs. I had to follow my doppelganger down her rabbit holes uh, and and that brought me to, to Steve Bannon. And, and so, you know, it has a feeling of falling. It has a feeling of sort of, I, I I was a very destabilized, it, I wanted to capture that feeling of vertigo that I think a lot of us started to feel where we didn't know who we could trust. Um, we saw people changing. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I know I know several people who changed a lot during, yeah. during, in the past few years, who, who almost became doppelgangers of themselves. Um, so there's, there's, there's definitely some some risk, I, I suppose. I guess that's what you're asking me. Is like, um, did you did you want to be so revelatory? <laughs> is it a good idea to be so revelatory? I don't know. Um, I just it was my goal to write in the way that I talk to my friends because yeah. I feel like I actually had a doppelganger who, which was my serious self. Because right. anyone who knows me personally knows that I um, I'm not that serious. Like I I have a very dark sense of humor and. I, there's a, like, I, I'm always sort of in, in the laugh cry emoji of it all. Like, a, a, and, and so for whatever reason, I felt that in order to be taken seriously as a woman writing about economics, right. I needed to perform a certain kind of seriousness. And the thing about having a doppelganger, the thing about somebody else being perceived as you by the world, by a significant portion of the world, is that it forces you to take yourself less seriously. Because what it means is that, you know, if there's a doppelganger, of you, George, out there who many, many millions of people think is you, and that person's doing all kinds of wild things that you would never do, then it means that you've kind of been wasting your time, like creating this persona and and caring so much about your public image. So to me, I found that in the end liberating as a writer, where I was just like, let's just play. None of it matters. Like it's all for naught. People think you're on Tucker Carlson's show and just, you know, claiming that the pandemic was, um, you know, a coup to overthrow the rest, well, the West. And, so, and if you haven't read it yet, and I hope you do, the doppelganger in question is Naomi Wolf, who is another guest who sat on the Red Chair show uh, back in the day. We, I remember interviewing her a long time ago. And uh, at that time, I think she had written a book, Untangling, her words, The Female Orgasm. And uh, that was... Ooh, you interviewed her about vagina. Uh, vagina, right. And she told me that it was a bundle of Christmas lights. And if one work, one light doesn't work, none of it works. And I remember thinking, also liberating, because I cannot, I am not, not, that is a whole other thing. But people actually thought you were Naomi Wolf. And this is, I think, what is what this doppelganger thing. They thought I wrote that book. They thought they you thought wrote I that wrote book. Which is <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, if you, uh, if you were to think of, like in a, if you were to cook up in a lab, you know, like a version of me that was like designed to push all of my particular neuroses, like in the Christmas lights, it would be just somebody writing a biography of their vagina while making factual errors live on the BBC. 
that is just like here have your have your doppelganger right so I, I, I honestly enjoy the sense of the absurd in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and it ends up being a kind of a meditation on the self, on why we care so much about our public images, because I do believe it is consumed. Like, you know, I, in, in the book, I referenced the, the movie Don't Look Up, but Adam McKay's uh, Climate Change. I loved it. It's, yeah. I think it was one of the brilliant comedies. I adore Adam McKay. And um, but, you know, that that image of us, you know, as humanity, like 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 making this selfie video while the asteroid is hurling towards earth like that the self is taking up too much space like we have bigger problems than our own, than our public images so right. you know you asked why i wrote personally i don't think you can write about this from the outside like if you're not willing to put skin in the game if you're not willing to to make a fool of yourself and admit to really embarrassing things why would anyone listen to you because mm -hmm nobody's outside of this we're all in this in this stew of of narcissism and mirrors and reflections and performance so if i didn't cop to my own failings in all of this then i would just be somebody on the outside shaking their finger right. um seeming like i'm above it all when i'm not right. you know and 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 things have changed right the the narratives always change conversations change what the audience what, what who the audience is changes and i think I think you're right. There are certain eras where earnestness was more at the top of the list and there are eras where it is not. Then we reach this weird era now that we're in, which I kind of like, but it's mostly because I have a, I'm a very positive nihilist, right? I, I don't think it's meaningful, but I'm here to try anyway. And we're in, as you said, it's a very surreal time right now. And we're, we live in post-fact, we live in post-truth, we live in avatar. Uh, Instagram influencers can make more money who are models. Instagram AI models make more money than actual models in some cases now. People know they're supporting something that is computer generated and everybody seems to be okay with the journey, which is, you know, for a person who grew up watching Terry Gilliam movies, I'm here for it. Like, what, I don't understand how we even begin to speak. What I loved about your book is there for sure the absurd and, and you are leaning into it and you're copying to things. But at the end of the day, it comes back to some really big divisions that we can fix and need to be fixed. And I was going to jokingly say off the top of the show that you and I having a conversation, let's have a drinking game for anybody watching. Every time we say capitalism, take one shot. Every time we say <laughs> class war, take two. Because in a way, a lot of this comes down to, to that. Great neuroscientists and work with marketing companies who work with code writers who essentially biohack our brains and rewire us. We know that that's not conspiracy. We know that is part of the story of the big companies that have popped up in the last 10, 12 years. So many of them feed into a version of narcissism, which is, and maybe narcissism is too heavy a word because what it does is it feeds to a version of our expressing ourselves. And a lot of people couldn't express for a long time or couldn't be heard and now they can be heard so navigating all this it's just just a hell of a time as drake said to be alive yeah it's it's wild and 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 i think part of what's sad about it is that i think it if it weren't so drink like if it weren't for capitalism i think that a lot of this could be a lot more fun like a lot of it could there could be i think there's something wonderfully mm -hmm. exciting about being able to perform a version of you that is not you out there in the ether, like to experiment with self-expression in that way, to have that freedom, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, I teach university students and I, you know, I, I they, they, many of them are kind of nostalgic for the an earlier internet, right? When they were able to play on Tumblr um, and just experiment with identity, including sexual identity and gender identity and just play. But it is the gamification and it is figuring out the business model that that changed it but i think it's more than that like it isn't just oh okay they're running this thing like like a vegas casino it isn't just the narcissism though that's there it's also the flip side of it is is the insecurity and how like i don't think we are just out there on the internet performing ourselves for clicks because we're addicted i think that we're doing it because we're terrified of being left behind and losing our little piece of real estate, you know, in 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 this hyper competitive, hyper individualized economy that has told us that we're not going to get a job, we're not going to have a pension. Um, everybody is our competitor, even our friends, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I mean, that that is something that I think we need to 
think more about. And I think we need to find a way to talk about it that is not sort of finger pointing and shaming of like, oh, this person is is performative and that person is a narcissist. It's like none of us built, none of us chose this system, you know, and a lot of it is just how much we're asking of the self, right? If you're not going to have a job, you know, you're not going to have a, you know, an income or any of the sort of security that, that previous generations took for granted, then yeah, we're going to expect a lot of ourselves. We're going to, yeah. we're going to, we're going to, we're, we are going to perform ourselves like our life depends on it because it does, right? Unless yeah. we change the system to something better. So yeah. You're right. Drink. Drink. <laughs> People, um, <laughs> No one can get into the housing market, which I think is a, is a crisis uh, in people's psychology because that was always the thing that generations were told you needed to do. And I think we don't. I know we talk about a housing crisis, certainly in Canada. We talk about a housing crisis as a political potato, but it's actually a crushing thing, I think, for the state of the mind of the country. Um, the, the fact that people can't get into it, never mind even affordable rent stuff people get get into and i think you're right people's lives do depend on it because if if advertisers can't reach people on traditional television the way they used to or radio i mean look we're here on youtube people will watch mm -hmm. this ads will be popping up on this for sure right mm -hmm. and people have to perform because they soundcloud rappers are buying houses and it's another version of the dream the thing that we can change yeah. right yeah. the thing that, and i think it's about affecting or exerting as much control as we can have. What did you learn about you though when you finished this? Because you do, and I want to, I, at some point I want to dive into some specific things you wrote about in the book, uh, which probably the things that got a lot of the comments on our posts when we told people that you and I were going to have this conversation. But what did you learn about yourself and the way you approach getting this message out to people? Um, I think I, I learned, I mean, the, the main lesson that I learned was just as much as possible to try to, to, to unself, to, to, to I, you know, I use this um, term from Iris Murdoch, unselfing, which as Iris Murdoch is a, is a, is a novelist and philosopher um, who talked about how, you know, when you are in that transcendent state of being swept away by something beautiful, which, mm -hmm in her telling could be a bird or it could be a painting it could be but something that sweeps you away i mean it could be music but if we think about those moments when we are when we experience true awe what's transcendent about it is that we forget ourselves like we actually are less conscious of uh, we're not thinking how how am i going to react to this do i have the right facial expression while it's happening like you know um like how will others see me seeing this you're actually in it yeah. you know um and and so that i think is the discipline that this wild journey uh of trying to understand what it means to lose control over your public self and play with that and look use it to look at all these other doublings that surround all of us um yeah, I try. I, 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 it's a discipline. It's not like you do it and then it's done. It's like you do it and then you do it again. It's like you do it 20 times a day. If you're doing it right, you're reminding yourself right. to, to unself. And so what I try, like in, even just in, in talking about the book, I really try to do the opposite of what I'm supposed to do, which is have talking points that I repeat in every interview. I try, what I try to do is tell myself, like, I am here, even though this is a weird and we're on YouTube and it's sponsored by Apple and who knows what people are saying in the comments. I am having a conversation with George mm -hmm. who I've not seen in many years, who's going to say things that I hadn't thought of. And I'm just going to actually try to open my ears and listen and be in conversation and maybe be changed by it while accepting the contradiction that this is commerce, you know, uh, there are ads sold, there are books that are, that I'm hoping to sell. There's all these contradictions, but I, I really am trying to actually be present in the conversations that I have. And I think there's so much joy. Like, that's what I love about writing is that it is, even though it's very solitary, it's actually a conversation with everybody who I've ever read before, who I bring to the page. And then, and then people encounter it, whether they're reading or they're listening. Um, and then they think new thoughts with it, right. you know, and then right. they write those thoughts. And then I read those thoughts. And it, it's like this, 
it's this beautiful conversation. So I'm trying to, I feel like long form is so rare right now. Like you said at the beginning, like our attention spans are shot. So when somebody decides to spend that many hours with you mm -hmm. and just trust you enough to go on a strange journey like that, I just feel very moved by that. And I feel excited to hear what they do with it. Absolutely. Like I hear from people who are twins, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I'm not a twin. And it's like, and they have, they share these stories about how wonderful it is not to be singular. Right. And they're like, and it's like, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who was like, I feel so sorry for people who aren't twins because it must be so lonely. Right. I love that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't have had that perspective. I'm not a twin. Um, learning so, yeah, and seeing other learn people, time. learning and seeing other people's lives, I think are ones that are maybe unfiltered, you know, not by an algorithm, not by a presentation, but just speaking to people. And I found that no matter where I've gone in my career, if you get in the rooms with people, you can, you can find some, ver not, it doesn't have to always be common ground because that's not, I don't think that's always the goal. The goal is, can you just, can you hang? <laughs> can you have a moment? And then it doesn't have to, so not everything has to be everything all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, a good conversation is a conversation where you are not thinking the whole time about what you're going to say next, but you are actually yeah. creating space to listen and potentially be changed or potentially be uncomfortable. Um, but there's, I mean, it's a muscle that's atrophying actually. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So you, when you wrote this in the book and read this, when we were trying to figure out, all right, we're going to post a picture, an image, you know, caption and thumbnail are the key to get people to pay attention. I remember sitting there, I was going to record the video, and I thought, I want to read this part. This part. Yeah, you like know, the conspiracists get the facts wrong, but get the feelings right often, is what you said, essentially. And I, and I did that because I love the quote. I have felt that way for sure. But also I knew that I was going to hear from people at different points of view. And we did. A lot of them said we weren't wrong. We actually got the facts right. Now, a lot of that was connected to COVID, connected to the vaccine, uh, certainly connected to how the media portrayed it. Uh, and I, I loved watching the debate develop in the comment section because it's not that they got facts right or facts wrong or somebody else got facts right or facts wrong, is that everybody acted with a certainty and nobody had the right to be certain. Mm -hmm. And people's lives were affected. People lost jobs. Families were split up. There was a, there was a huge cleaved, you know, places that have survived tons of conversations cleaved because of this. And then I knew because you're, again, no fool, you put that in very intentionally. And I'm just curious how you got to that place. Yeah. I mean, what, the point in the book where I talk about this is, you know, I do, I, 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 I kind of use my double, Naomi Wolf, who became very active in the, um, I would call it a COVID disinformation uh, world. I mean, she was one of the people who made claims about vaccine shedding, for instance, right. which, uh, so, so the idea that uh, she was warning women that they had to be careful about being near vaccine women who other women who'd been vaccinated because their vaccine could shed on them and it could affect their periods and fertility and so on and 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 so um it you know it's not i don't i mean i don't know what people were referring to specifically when they said we were right i that was not right okay yeah, that I, i'm just gonna that was the wrong thing um but 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 it but when i sort of followed her into the world that she now inhabits which is a very right-wing world she's on steve bannon's show sometimes every day um i really listened like i listened to hundreds of hours uh of of her and him and others and it was a kind of a mix and match of some true things and some false things it was not all false and often um, the feelings that they were speaking to were feelings that I very much recognize and identify with, like a rightful suspicion of big pharma, um, rightful suspicion of big tech that I share. Whereas in my like left wing and liberal world, there was a very kind of obedient stance towards uh, all of the public health measures, particularly so once the right really, you know, became all about 
opposing masking, vaccines, right. vaccine verification acts, and so on. And when that became the sort of agenda of a resurgent right, then the response from the left was, we are the people who just tell you to follow all the rules very aggressively. And it's like, okay, some of those rules, I think we're good, but we should have asked for much more than those rules. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you know, I, I, I think schools should have been open, but different. You know, I think we should have focused on hiring more teachers and teaching assistants. And one of the things I did during COVID was do a deep dive um, into the kinds of things that happened during the Great Depression and the kinds of jobs programs that happened. And by the way, there were there were pandemics then, too. Um, And so, you know, we could have been investing in tree planting programs and outdoor ed and all kinds of safe ways for young people to be t- together, right? And I-, I teach university students. I know what a kind of a, a s- stress on mental health mm-hmm. that isolation was, particularly for young people. And so, you know, if the the left or, or the center left is just kind of saying, follow the rules, um, abide by the lockdowns, and not putting forward more ambitious agendas to transform the public sphere, it, uh, um, then, yeah, I can see why people are, you know, migrated over there. So that's what I'm trying, that's what I was trying to get at. That's what I mean by they get the facts wrong with the feelings right. And not all of their facts are wrong. Right. Um but you know, some very, very significant ones were and are wrong, and they had real public health impacts. Um, but as you say, you know, um, so did the decision to keep schools closed. So did the dis- decision to lock down. There really weren't any good options. Um, I think where things get sinister is when you you take those bad options and you imply that it's part of a global conspiracy, you know, and impute the absolute worst motives, right? Um, that it's not just like a government that is sort of fairly dysfunctional after decades of austerity, doesn't really know how to do anything and is suddenly in the middle of a massive public yeah. health emergency um, and is scrambling, which is, I think, what we were mainly facing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I I remember doing these late night live streams when I went back home. I was in LA get ready to launch a show and then the prime minister did that whole come home thing and work wasn't going to happen. So I went home and I remember going live on Instagram saying, um, I'm, I followed the rule. I said online, I hate that I listened and I hate that about me that I listened because I'm not the kind of guy that listens to this sort of thing. But I'm not a scientist. I don't know. So I just kind of went with, I entered into a social contract. So by being in public with my limited amount of science information, what am I going to do? I'm just going to go with what potentially could save some lives, keep people. I'm just, that's what I'm going to go with. And I remember being, and you too, we would be attacked for whatever position you would take. You would be attacked by either side. And everybody just felt like that the, it was left versus right. And I'm just curious if you think about this, because I looked at most of these people and I say, most of them weren't even left. I don't even think the left is as big as people think. Or as powerful as people think that most of them are just people in the middle who suddenly, who have always kind of got along with the rules and suddenly got positioned as left. The left had their own issues, mm-hmm. for sure. Don't, and they still do. But I looked around and I just thought, I don't even think that the left, right, center descriptors work anymore because the people on the right didn't know what the people on the extreme right were doing and who were the Tea Party at one point are now then had the White House. And you're like, what? I don't think any of these old definitions work anymore. And mm-hmm. I think it's what part of the confusion was in this conversation. Yeah, and 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 there's a change in in the political map. I mean, this is part of what I was trying to to do with the book is sort of make a bit of a map of the wildness of the post COVID world. Even though we're still we still have COVID, but mm-hmm. you know, I think signals started scrambling. There was a lot of crossover. As I, you know, I said I, I live in I live in British Columbia, which is you know Canada's sort of lotus land, right? Um, and you know where I live, there were a lot of crossovers from like the kind of yoga wellness world, um, alternative health, over to the far right, you know, political parties that mainly focus on anti-immigrant, um, you know, climate change denial. So like weird sort of strange bedfellows that I wanted to understand. And I think a lot of um, a, a lot of it did happen because, you know, 
some of these things kind of rhyme, right? Like, so you're very concerned about healthy food. You're very concerned about GMOs. You're bit, we're concerned about you. You re, you want to lead like a natural lifestyle, and then suddenly you're being told to get a vaccine, right. um, and then you're hearing that this is part of a big pharma conspiracy and so on. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to 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 map these new alliances, but I agree with you. The old left right lines are not working, and that's why. Uh, in the book, I quote some political scientists who describe this as diagonalism, like a right. di diagonal migration that doesn't sort of follow follow the, that axis. The great being the enemy of good, I think, is how I kind of look at where we are in this world now with trying to get people to get anything done. If it isn't perfect, uh -huh. we tear it apart. And I wonder if you, are you an optimistic person about where we go? Uh, <laughs> um. So we do, we definitely do that online. Do we do it? Uh, and I think, you, you know, when you were talking about the way people were reacting, I mean, part of, part of what was happening in that period was we are social beings, as you said at the beginning, we need each other, we need to gather. Um, and COVID created sort of optimal conditions, I think, for terrible behavior where we had, first of all, social isolation, second of all, fear, um, about something that we did not understand. It was a novel virus. Um, so there's going to be a gap between, um, you know, understanding that we're in this crisis and understanding really what this crisis is and how long it's going to last and what it's going to do. And it was, it was very terrifying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started the pandemic in the New York, New Jersey area where, which was really ground zero. I think for a lot of friends of mine in Canada saw it very much more as an abstraction because they weren't hearing the ambulances. They weren't, mm -hmm. they didn't have friends who were ending up in hospital. They didn't lose people. Um, so it didn't feel abstract in those early days in, in the U.S., uh, in, in particularly that part of the U.S. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we were isolated, scared, and then we go on these platforms to try to get some simulation of the relationships that we miss, the, the relationships that tell us who we are, because we aren't just who we think we are. We are also who we tell each other mm -hmm. that we are. You know, our friends tell us who we are, our family tell, tell, tell us who we are. And so we go online and with, that's when we get caught up in these algorithms that I think encourage the worst parts of ourselves. And I'm not going to like rehash all of this. Yeah. Um, but I think the piece that we that that is important to understand and that is diff that is different from other, you know, I've I've covered big disasters in the past. I've covered hurricanes and wars, and you know, I've seen people behave uh, in different, you know, under extreme circumstances. What I haven't seen before is the monetize the monetization of conspiracy. But that is what is different about the COVID era. The conspiracy influencers. Where yeah, they, and I don't call them conspiracy theorists. I call them conspiracy influencers because there there really isn't a coherent theory. You're moving from sort of hot button to the next, you know, whatever people are talking about. You're out there making the wild claims, um, and you're getting you're getting rewarded for it. You're getting you're getting huge numbers of new followers. You're getting huge numbers of views. And I watched people who used to be like vaguely reliable just completely. Um, just get addicted to that business model. And I want to be clear that there's a difference between the influencers who have really cracked this mm -hmm. and the people who are watching them and going to them because they actually think they're going to find answers. Yeah. Those are, that's a different experience. Um, and I think, I think uh, the, that, that was the piece of it that I think it, that like that was the wild card that I think we're still recovering from and still very much in because you just, it's like a heat seeking missile. You just, you're going and you're trying to figure out where, where's the next, where, where, where's the, where is the next crisis that's going to give you that kind of traction? Cause people saw their, 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 their followers explode in a way that was totally unprecedented during it, this era. Aside from the, the, the access to everybody on their phones in their homes kind of thing or wherever they are, is it much different in your mind than a bunch of celebrities selling cigarettes or like, like there's always been a version of this where people have monetized a way um, to tell us things that weren't true uh, and, oh, yeah. and they just do it. And this is just as, this is just a hyper version of it because we live in a very hyper time. Mm. Well, I think, 
you're right, but the, you know, the, the, the selling cigarettes is an interesting example because that is pretty regulated, right? I mean, at a certain point, but they covered um, the they covered up the stuff. Everybody, they were lying to <laughs> us, you know. You know, yeah, you couldn't like have cartoon characters selling cigarettes <laughs> anymore, or 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 put ads on television. Um, but I think it's the combination of politics and medicine that. Um, you know, it isn't just like selling us a product. It, it, it's, it's, it's the news itself that is the currency that is creating a sort of informational quicksand. Um, that is a problem because we, we do live in a time of overlapping and intersecting very real emergencies. And so if we don't know what is real, um, if, you know, like, is something like an hour after Lahaina burns, there's already a conspiracy about it having been like space lasers. Right. I mean, how are we going to do anything if we can't agree on any basic facts whatsoever? Like that's a situation. There's there's people now who don't even believe in democracy. And, and I, I think you can lay not all the blame, but I think you can lay a fair share of the blame at the role the media played in, in creating a scenario where nobody trusted. Um, I mm. don't think it's just that. I think the influence of money in politics, I think the influence in, of money in influencers, as you say, I think that definitely is significant. But the news would have been a place. But now we can quite rightfully look back at it and go, but they weren't all telling the truth either. And governments yeah. have been lying. You know, British Columbia, you wrote about in the book, and I love the way you've talked about this in the past, that even the name British Columbia is very problematic, right? So it's all been fed to yeah. us. No, I know. And I mean, some of my most... Um kind of vertiginous quicksand moments was, you know, listening to Steve Bannon and hearing him do a critique of the corporate media that I had trouble not, not nodding my head along to, right? Where he, you know, he'd do a collage of all the, you know, CNN and MSNBC shows brought to you by Pfizer, brought to you by Moderna. And like, Look, I mean, I, I that could have been me. That could have been Noam Chomsky. That could have been, you know, any number of leftists yeah. um, doing an analysis of, of, of how you manufacture consent. Um, so that's where you have this dialogue, you know, between this sort of um, over suspicion and over credulity. And that's what I mean by the mirror world. Yeah. It's like we're reacting, like we're, we're sort of like reverse marionettes, whatever one does, the other does the exact opposite. Um, and I think we're all distracting ourselves from looking at the um, truly terrifying realities, you know, whether it is our implications of systems of um, basically slave labor to keep the lights on and the internet going um, and and to keep, you know, to produce the commodities of our lives. I mean, it's hard to be alive to the, 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 the sort of shadow lands that our, our lives depend on. And so we've had, we have these reckonings, these moments where we suddenly open our eyes to, you know, how our countries were created and uh, the racial justice reckonings in 2020 were that in Canada, the, the, the confirmations of the unmarked graves at Indian residential schools were these moments where it's like, what is our country? What is our society? And people come out and they look at it for a while. But, you know, I think looking at these realities as atomized individuals who are trying to optimize ourselves and so isolated it's impossible like this mm -hmm. is collective work it is much too hard to reckon with the past and the future racing towards us with the climate crisis and the present of our reliance when you think about covid and yeah we were locked at home but what about all the essential workers who were out there bearing all of the risks you know and so we had these moments where like wait a minute we live in a class war and it, like we had to say class war right you yep. promise <laughs> so so it's it's like that's a lot of reality to right. actually hold and so yeah. i think of course we stare at ourselves and our phones and each other and we scream and we avoid actually looking at you know what i call the shadow lands so we, we play these mirror games um, because it's a lot more comfortable than looking at what we are all implicated in and we can look at it but we can't look at it unless we are looking at it together if you know what i mean like yeah. if, unless we're holding it together and unless we have a plan to get out of some of this right like so you asked me if i was in did you ask me if i was an optimist i did yeah i mean I mean, do I sound like an optimist? <laughs> Weirdly, you do. 
actually. Mm. Weirdly, you do. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe this is, you know, sometimes we, when we say things, we, they're, they're projections, they're versions of ourselves that we hope to get to. <laughs> you know, in a, in a weird way, you kind of do. Because I think, I think, you know, Oxfam put out this report, right? The world's five richest men have more than doubled their fortunes uh, since 2020 at a rate of 14 million per hour. It's an enormous amount of money. People have made money for a long time. But I, I, I hear a lot, and maybe even have said in the past that we're in such divided times. But I don't actually think we're as divided as we as it's presented to us. Because when we were growing up, I remember there was a big divide generationally where you would say, the world's broken, the world's broken, the world's broken. And the, the establishment, your family, whatever your parents would say, no, you know what? It's actually okay. We're going to get there. Now those people, especially in our groups who've become right-wing or become or were always conservative the ones who stormed the capital they were the defenders of government for the longest time now they're saying it's broken so finally we all agree it's broken i think it'll be painful and nearly impossible to get to a place where we can find a way forward but we all agree so in a way i feel like we're halfway there which is the most optimistic i've ever been about this scenario mm. yeah and that's you know i that's where i think we need to figure out how to find bridges with people who maybe we've severed relationships with. Uh, you know, th th this was, as you said, these were years where families have broken apart and old friendships and, you know, I can't deal with that person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think people, when people were very afraid for their health, that became like, okay, I'm not inviting this person home for the holidays. I can't, you know, I can't be in a room with them. And, um, you know, the reason why I was saying there's a difference between the big time influencers who are monetizing and the people who are turning to them for answers. I, I mean, I, 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 the reason why it's important to understand that there's a difference is that most people are not the big time monetizers. Right. Most yeah. people are just looking at, and, and those are people who I think in many cases can be reached and the people they can be reached by are the people who they've known their whole lives, like the people who they have relationships with. And it is worth trying to figure out if there's anything you agree on. Like, mm -hmm. do you both hate uh, Big Pharma for different reasons, but maybe yeah. like, um, and try to find some some bridges because because chances are if they've spent enough time in in um, conspiracy land, they might be getting tired of the grifts, right. you know, and they might have noticed some of the cracks in the stories and how many times the story has changed. Um, and they might be a little disillusioned and they might be feeling a little fleeced because there's yeah. uh, there's a lot of fleecing that goes on and they might be ready to to walk over that bridge or meet halfway or something like that, you know. <laughs> but I want to be clear that I don't believe we change this one uncle at a time, no. you know, like I think it is worth trying to rebuild those relationships. But I also think that we have to address the underlying brokenness that you're referring to. Like, it's not just enough to agree that it's broken. Yeah. We also have to have some buy-in on some fixes, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. That, that's where things get tricky. And, and, and there was a way that, you know, look, we know that it didn't work for everybody. It only worked for who it worked for, with democracy. I think sometimes people forget how new it is, really, <laughs> over here relative to how long people have been uh, subjected to the, the whims of others and the powerful ones. But if people don't believe in any of the democratic systems and they have lots of legitimate reasons to have issue with them, how do you do it? Think of all the countries around the world that are, you know, that are going pretty hard the other way uh, than yeah. maybe what, so in, in a way that won't be good for poor people. Because to me, a lot of this is about poverty. If you're not getting people out of poverty, there is no hope for any of this to work. Because, and I think our system's designed so that the middle and the the lucky can actually just exist on the backs of the poor. Um, and, yeah. but if people don't believe in the democratic system, how do you change anything? Yeah, I mean, this is... Um you know, I, what I was saying about how the book sort of starts kind of more playfully and yeah. funny, and it does end up in this kind of yeah. um, uh, more sinister exploration of our collective doppelganger, our collective double, which I think is the the anti-democratic, authoritarian, fascistic society. Yeah. And that's why a lot of filmmakers have used the doppelganger, the figure of the double, as a way to explore that that feeling that you have that it's actually closer than you would like like right. closer than you than it's ever been in our lives and you know i have friends in india who are like 
it's flipped. Like we've moved, we've flipped from an open society to a closed society. Like my neighbors are now the mob, you know, uh, who, who are banging down the door looking for, uh, you know, infidels and, or looking for Muslims specifically. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I know people in Italy who, who, who feel the same way, like it's flipping, it's flipping and it's, and, and, and I think in Canada, where I am, you know, we can be a little bit smug about this. It's like, it's always like the U.S., the U.S. might flip fascist, but I don't feel that way. I mean, I, I think I think we have to take this very, very seriously. I agree with you. Um, that's all we have. You know, my friend Astra Taylor um, we will miss it when it's gone. It doesn't democracy doesn't exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Um, yeah. And we do we have these tools. They're deeply flawed. We have to use the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. Um, because the stakes are extraordinarily high because these grifters, some of them have a very, like, this is why I'm fascinated by Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is a grifter, but he is not just a grifter. You know, he's selling all kinds of stuff. He's selling currency, he's selling survival meals, he's selling his new social media platforms. But he, what he really wants is to get back into the White House. Mm -hmm. And he is weaving together an international fascistic alliance, you know, with far right parties all over the world, in Brazil, in Italy, in, in, in Germany. And he's very serious about it. And he does, I don't believe he believes in democracy at all. I don't believe, you know, I think he is turning truth and reality into putty for a political reason. He wants us not to believe what is right in front of us, because that is an authoritarian dream. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I feel like like that, like when somebody like Naomi Wolf, um, who many people think is me or, or used to, I think they still do. Um, <laughs> you know, she used to be a prominent feminist. Like I interviewed her when I was at, at my campus newspaper. She was yeah. the first author I ever interviewed. Yeah, and I don't want to give away um, the ending of the book, but there's a pretty powerful thing at the end of this book about with you and yeah. Naomi. Yeah. 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 Um, but but you know she was this feminist icon she she was she was an advisor to al gore and she was um you know she was she was the sort of center of 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 liberal power in lots of ways and for her to be um you know as aligned with somebody like steve bannon for her now to sort of shrug off attacks on reproductive rights um for her to engage in election denialism um for her to you know speculate that maybe january 6 isn't what we thought it was and so on you know if like and for people to think that's me like that is like a head trip because it's like it shows like it's like it's like a warped reflection in the mirror like we always think oh i could never be that but when it's that close, it forces you to realize like people change and societies change. Mm -hmm. They can change very, very quickly. Um, and we are in one of those volatile moments. I always say, you know, it can change for the worse or the better. Like we, we are in a malleable moment, right? Like, as you say, you have this widespread recognition that everything is broken. Mm -hmm. That can either go you know, FDR New Deal, like, let's actually roll up our sleeves and fix it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, no, it, it wasn't perfect. But, um, you know, it, it built what little social safety net the US had. Um, and or, or it or it flips, or it flips fascist. I mean, it, it's not like nothing happens in, right. in moments like this, right? So Wow, I thought we were going to have like a cheerful discussion. We started yeah, off. But... There's some smiles. I'll try to get to that eventually. Listen, I haven't even brought up this when you're book, and I want to. Um, mm. You're on your book tour, and October seventh happens, and mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's really important that we talk about Palestine and talk about Israel and talk about what's going on a hundred days later. But you were on your book tour when it happened. What was your initial reaction? Because we've seen this be an issue that's changed people too. Yep. Yeah, very quickly. Um, yeah, I, I, I was, I, I was on to, I actually was home for a few days when it happened, and I'm glad I was home, um, and then went back out. Um, and you know, I should say that the book ends in Palestine. The book ends in the last chapter of the book is about Israel Palestine, and it looks at Israel and Palestine as, as an example of what I call doppelganger politics in the sense that. Um, that the sort of Zionism, I, you know, I grew up in a in a lefty Jewish household. I went, but I did go to Jewish day school, and I did get 
a sort of a version of Holocaust education that presented the Israeli state as a sort of um, like reparations for the Holocaust um, and and really as the only possible response to the to a kind of hatred of, of, of Jews that I sort of learned was something that could never be confronted with universal human rights. It needed its own state. It needed, it needed to fortress itself that this would never disappear. And I realized that that was such a pessimistic I, uh, um, vision of how to respond to hate. And, you know, I think so many people on this planet have been the subject and are the subject of othering, of, of, of being treated as less than human. And there's so much potential uh, for alliance, for, for bridges, mm -hmm. for coalition that is so that is so much stronger when we see that commonality as opposed to just kind of fortressing one's own group, right? Um, and of course, I was horrified by October 7th, um, you know, and, and wrote about it. And, and, you know, and I've been writing about... Um, the assault on Gaza, which I do believe is genocidal. You know, I've been transfixed by the the um, the South Africa's case in The Hague or, or the, see, know, their, yeah. their application yeah. for, for a case. It hasn't uh, it hasn't been ruled on whether or not they're actually going to have a genocide trial in The Hague. But, you know, um, it was, you know, the, the first uh, activism that I engaged in at University of Toronto was anti-apartheid activism. Uh, and I was sort of the generation, the, the cohort that was sort of the last group to fight for divestment. And I think maybe this is what turned me into an activist my whole life, because I had this idea that it was easier than it actually is to change things because people had been fighting against apartheid for decades. And then in 1989, I started university. We had one protest and Nelson Mandela was freed a few weeks later. And I was like, wow, we did it. Or so, you know, but I, I, um, there was something just so powerful to me about South Africa, um, being the country that went to the Hague and makes the case, um, that never again means never again to anyone. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I write about in the book is that in so many ways that the, 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 the story of the Holocaust that I grew up with wasn't true. It was this story that that treated it that, that lifted the Holo the Nazi Holocaust out of time, and it was almost forbidden to compare it to any other any other event in history. It was so extreme, and um, and the since in some of the research that I did in the book, I, I was a, I I read for the first time. Um, black scholars like W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, M. A. Cesar, the uh, um, who were writing in the 40s and 50s about fascism in Germany being a doppelganger, a double of imperialism and anti-black racism, um, and um, you know, making the case that 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 what what this was was a kind of a homecoming to Europe of the technologies of extermination and annihilation that had been used against the so-called darker nations around the world, including indigenous, na indigenous nations mm -hmm. um, in settler colonial nations like Canada. And, um, you know, I never had heard that idea. I had, you know, but this is the argument that Raoul Peck, the filmmaker made in Exterminate All the Brutes, mm -hmm. which came out on HBO, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. And, you know, I write about this in the book, but, you know, what if instead of of, of thinking about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust as being sort of outside of history, what if we reconnected it with history and we told this longer story, then I think we would understand the mistake that was made in thinking about an ethno state, Israel, as a reparation for genocide, because what we did is we kind of passed the mantle, or what they did, we weren't alive, but passed, you know, said, like, it's passed the mantle uh, of ethnic cleansing to the Jews. And that's not reparations, that's reproduction of, of a logic that I think is part of the logic that produced the Holocaust. Um, so, you know, this is very sticky stuff, but, yeah. and um, listen, you know, yeah. you know, you, you didn't even have to say that for people to, and they said it in our comments to be, and even the phrase that exists, self-hating Jew, which is what people in our oh. comments called you, right? <laughs> oh yes. And I'm sure it's not the first time you've heard that, but I know, but when you say things like yeah, this, whole life. yeah, your whole life. So <laughs> how do you, 
how do you have these conversations? How do you process that? Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. You know, I have honestly been hearing that comment since I was in university. And one of the things that is really different about that has been really different about this horrific period um, is I, I have never had such a powerful sense of community among other Jews. Um, you know, I'm sure people have saw the huge, huge demonstrations. Um, uh, Grand Central Station, uh, the Statue of Liberty. Um, you know, I was in Washington D.C. at the at the largest Jewish-led protest in solidarity with Palestinians, with hundreds of people, including many rabbis, were arrested in Congress. I was inside with Jewish Voice for Peace lobbying about ten Congress people to try to get them to uh, sign on to the ceasefire resolution. <clears throat> but I don't. I. I don't it's I, I find being called a self-hating Jew a little bit funny at this point because I actually feel like more I like I, I feel such a sense of community and, and a reconnection with a tradition um of dissent, of of universalism, but of particularity, right? Like we are showing up as Jews within a, a Jewish tradition that maybe is not the same Jewish tradition mm -hmm. that the people calling me self-hating in your comments, which I'm very glad I can't see, um, but I'll take your word for it. Um, Weird, you know, weirdly, okay, weirdly, I, I come and this from is... a different tradition. Like I come from a, a, a tradition, a, a, an anti-war tr tradition. The reason I live in Canada is because my father was a Vietnam War resistor, mm -hmm. um, you know, and my grandma was a communist. So I have my own tradition and so do lots of other Jews. And we don't hate ourselves. Yeah. We're just different. We just disagree agree with you you know and um, i think this is really important to state for people watching who, who who aren't sure you know i've i've read you since you started writing this I, i've interviewed you before i've always loved you know hanging out with you and, and 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 getting into your mind you of course been anybody who does what you do but you're very good at it you will be a polarizing figure to some but in this instance now yes we got some of those comments but by and large it was positive it was people very excited about your voice in your voice now in this time. And I think there is definitely a change. I, I, I've been in the media for 30 years, but in, in this kind of stuff for about 20, this is the first time I've seen this much support for Palestinians. It doesn't help when people are still dying and uh, at the rate they're helping. It's a small, it's not a consolation by any means, but it's the first time I've seen this much, even something as simple in Instagram where you go into messages and you see people's notes and I'm seeing watermelons pop up everywhere. I'm seeing more and more and more. And I know that winning a war on social media is not the same as, you know, actual change on the ground. But do you feel like this, this kind of reaction and resistance can be, can lead to something? You brought up apartheid, and I think this is a really important consideration. But I remember, and you remember this, part of the reason why that ended was because countries like the United States and Canada and the UK eventually took them a long time, eventually started to hold the South African government um, to account. It has been the opposite here with what's happening with Palestine and Israel right now in Gaza. So, Well, it was the opposite there for a long time, too. Yeah. Um, you know, the governments that ended up uh, um, sanctioning South Africa supported them and propped them up uh, before that. Um, so I think it can change and it changed under pressure. I mean, the South African boycott, divestment, sanctions movement was so mainstream. You know, I yeah. wrote an article about this recently for The Guardian and did a little deep dive into, you know, watching like those 80s videos of like Ain't Gonna Play Sun City with like Ringo Starr and Bruce Springsteen and just literally everyone you could possibly think of. It was really mainstream. Um, and it ha that that's what creates the tipping point. And I think with... Palestine, because it is, you know, I, I think that that because of the history of extreme oppression against Jews, because of the history of the Holocaust, because so many people receive that same message that Israel is reparations for the Holocaust, Israel is justice for the Holocaust, it isn't as straightforward for them to, uh, to just, as it was, to just be against white South Africans oppressing black South Africans. Mm -hmm. People feel more conflicted. And that's why I think it is really important that there is a generational shift among Jews. Um, and there are so many Jews who, who are in solidarity with Palestinians who are saying not in our name 
and are holding signs that say never again means never again to anyone. And that really is the split. Yeah. It is what is the lesson that we are going to learn from the horrors of human history, which are long and various. Um, there are there have always been two different interpretations of that never again cry um, uh, that came out uh, of the furnaces of the Second World War. One of them was never again to anyone. This is a logic. It predates the Holocaust and it will continue. Um, and that's why we need a genocide convention. That's why we need a UN Declaration of Human Rights. That's why we have to codify this and try to understand the logic and try to understand that it could happen to anyone. And so we need this architecture, architecture to stop it. But then there was another idea that was never again to the Jews that treated that hatred as, as exceptional and, and kind of incomparable to other forms of hatred. And, and made the argument that, that there needed to be a fortress ethnostate. And I think for a long time, people thought they could have both. They, th they thought they could have universal human rights and, and laws of war and a genocide convention. And there could also be this ethnostate that was just going to be a kind of insurance plan to make sure that the Jews aren't wiped out again. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Not when that, not, not when that ethnostate is practicing apartheid, not when it has practiced ethnic cleansing, and now not when it is practicing genocide being live streamed on Twitter and Instagram. So now we actually have to choose if we believe in democracy and human rights and universal applications of these conventions or not. Um, and I think there's a generational shift, and I think people are absolutely freaking out. Uh, 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 and they don't know what to do about the fact that there is a generational shift, even within Judaism, mm -hmm. that is saying the same laws should, the same rules should apply to everybody. Um, and that also means, by the way, that um, Palestinians don't get to wipe out Jews when it's their turn. I mean, it means everyone. It means everyone has a right to exist. Everyone has a right to equality. Everyone has a right to live in dignity. Nobody gets an ethno state. Can we live with that or not? Because like it's truth time. It's truth time. Like what what we're seeing now, I I am I I don't know how people, I don't know how people recover from this. Let alone the people who are living through it, just witnessing it, mm -hmm. just witnessing it. The, the, the coverage of this, uh, quite rightly, has been called into um, uh, called in front of the you know the principal here. And this, how would you rate the media and the way? And I'll say this the. People are losing their jobs over their position on this. Journalists are losing their job for covering things that are widely regarded as facts. I understand that people disagree, and there will be those who say that anything is justifiable for hostages. There's, there's, everybody has their own point of view on this. But journalists and people are, can't do anything, or some would say, and, they will, and they'll lose their jobs. And that's actually happening. People are losing their jobs for speaking out about this. So how would you rate the media's uh, coverage of this? They're, lo they're losing their jobs in media. They're they're losing their jobs at museums. They're losing their jobs on films. They're losing their jobs in the in, in universities. Um, I think that we're in the middle of a of a of a neo McCarthyism of a, a, a that that you know my my grandfather I I, I said my grandmother was a communist um, so was my grandfather and he he worked for Walt Disney and was blacklisted for trying to organize a union. Um, and a lot of Jewish people uh, experienced the first wave of McCarthyism. Um, and so there's something to me so kind of heretical uh, that watching watching people claiming to speak on behalf of Jews engaging in this type of uh, McCarthy behavior. But back to the media, I mean, what is there to say? It's been horrific. And with all the bashing of social media, I think it needs to be said, thank God that that mm -hmm. that social media has been there and that these it just there are no words to describe the bravery of Palestinian journalists who in Gaza who ha risk their lives multiple di times a day uh, so that we can have images. You know, the mainstream press is not in Gaza, like with very, very few exceptions. So um, I, I think it is a, it is a, it is a moment of such extreme shame <laughs> for our mainstream press, including some of the places you used to work. Um, and yeah, thanks for opening up the space to talk about it. Um, I, I think it's important. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, we started doing this on YouTube because I do like the idea of independence. And I, I also just want to talk. I, 
I do think what I said off the top is key, which is not everybody's going to agree with everything, and I don't care. I actually think that's important to hear it for sure. Do you... I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if that's part of what when you went down your, you know, your YouTube rabbit holes uh, of figuring this out and your Steve Bannon, if you got to yoga stuff and if you got to crystal balls. But if you did get to crystal balls, I mean, how do you see this ending? What tell, yeah, what what tells you like whether you see the current reckoning as the beginning of the end of the practice of Zionism or like how do you see this going? I think there's a generational shift. I think this is a moment where we're really going to be tested. You know, I think there's been amazingly moving solidarity and commitment and people coming out, you know, multiple times a week, despite the fact that, that they're being mischaracterized, smeared, um, you know, accused of outlandish things when all they're saying is stop killing people, mm -hmm. stop killing kids, stop it, stop bombing hospitals. Um, stop bombing schools, right? This is an ethical position. This is a moral position. And people are being accused of outrageous things. Um, and yet they're just going back, you know, despite all of the McCarthyism and despite all this. But I worry, you know, and I, I know a lot of people, you know, who, who, are, who are engaged with this are also worried that, you know, when people play by the rules, when they do the nonviolent protests, when they appeal to international law, when they try to make these conventions work, when, um, and it doesn't yield anything, when it's just raw power, raw money, that's what wins, that's what carries the day, that can be a very volatile moment. So um, I think there's, I think this is a moment to, yeah, take stock. Like I, I this, this generational shift is, is real. This flurry of firing is panic um, about and you know and all the think pieces about what it no it's not colonialism no you know like like I, I, it's it's interesting to me that a lot of the people who've gotten fired are people who are making connections between what is happening in Gaza and what happened what has happened to indigenous people uh, in the Americas um, or colonialism in Africa like it is or um, relationships between Black Lives Matter activists and Palestinian activists, it's really kind of the nodes of solidarity mm -hmm. that have been under attack. And that is a hint. That means that's where we should work. We should be building more of those bridges, more of those alliances, expanding the frame, making it less exceptional. You know, my friend I, in the book, I quote my friend Cecily Sarowski, who's one of the founders of Jewish Voice for Peace who explained to me the difference between re-traumatization and remembering. And, and she was saying, you know, re-traumatization is a loop. You just repeat the, the things that terrorize you over and over and over again. You can't get out, mm -hmm. right? You can think about this personally in your life, or you can think about it collectively as a group. Um, and remembering sort of puts the, the shattered pieces of the self back together again. And it's a sort of a reach towards wholeness. Um, I think that I the education that I received was an education in re-traumatization that was designed to keep me as afraid as I possibly could be and believing that people were out to get me so that I would support this fortress ethno state. Um, and now what is happening where people are saying um, Holocaust, not only one Holocaust, mm -hmm. that are looking at the connections between the Nazis and imperialism and colonialism and earlier genocides and later genocide and eco-fascism and... and it, that is the remembering. We're putting the pieces of our world together again, and it's a process of wholeness. Yeah. We're reaching towards wholeness. And you know what else we're doing? We're unselfing. We're actually seeing our connections with each other. And so I, I, I know that there's going to be temptations to give up on this and have it like it's going to feel too soft in the face of the power, that, like the force of, uh, uh, of violence there's a reason they're freaking out. It's, I think we're on the right path. Um, and, and I hope we can stick to our principles and, and our ethics. I could talk to you about all this um, for hours and hours, but I'm going to let you go soon. I just want to do one thing. First of all, before I get to this one thing, um, yeah. writing poems with your son and writing about your son and talking about that experience is so beautiful. And I wondered what that was like for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I write... I have a chapter on the child as double, um, the way 
sometimes we are trained as parents to think of our kids as little mini means. Um, and, you know, I have a, a child who is really not going to be any, a mini me. Um, uh, and, and I'm really grateful for that. I mean, he's, he is, um, you know, he's, he, he is on the spectrum and, and, and really marching to his own drum and, I actually don't write about him. I write around him. I write about 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 being a parent, but I I really it's very important to me to respect his right to decide how he represents himself to the world. Yeah. Um I don't see him as material. So I feel like I have a right to tell stories about what it's like to be a parent of a, you know, quote, quote unquote special needs child. I don't even share a diagnosis or anything. I right. feel like that's his private world. Right. And, you know, he's 11 now, like, he's not, he, he's too young to decide, like, I could ask him and he could say, it's fine, mama, but like, um, he doesn't know if it's fine or not, you know, right. so I, I also kind of wanted to model what it would be like to not treat your child like material. So he, so there's, a, there's kind of mystery about him that I, that I, that I feel very fiercely protective of. So I'll write about my own neuroses as a parent, but <laughs> his inner world is off limits. <laughs> I think that's a very responsible way. And that's actually part of what I'll get into this. I want to just throw out a couple of names or actually more than a couple. And I just want a one-liner thought on them. You can pass, oh. but you don't need to pass. All right. Hillary Clinton. Oh, oh God. Um, we're starting you just easy. want like a verdict? Yeah, we're starting easy. A thought, to the, your choose. To the Hague. Oh man, Trump. <laughs> to prison. What is the first meeting slash call between Prime Minister Polyev and President Trump going to be like? And maybe that guy from oh. Argentina. God, that's such garbage. Oh my God. Talk about pessimistic, nihilistic. <laughs> what did you call yourself? I'm a pessimist. very positive nihilist and uh, and I have a, I have a lifetime of history to back up this point of view. <laughs> oh it's, gosh. It, listen, it's, I mean, it, it's very possible. Let's, it's very possible. Let's very possible and 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 we should do everything we can to prevent that reality as much as it as much as it's difficult to do um next yeah. one canadian house of commons things can always get worse okay that's my that's my one-liner things Think can always get the worst canadian house of commons today um oh today i missed it what happened no no like to like where we are in this state right now um weak Tom York. <laughs> um, uh, uh, a model of uniqueness. <laughs> I remember uh, when they would come through Much Music and how big an impact No Logo your book had on them, how big mm -hmm. it was to them. It truly really changed them. Um, AI. It changed me for it to change them, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> AI. Um, uh, a mirroring and mimicry machine um, that will make us feel that things are original, but will just reflect us back to ourselves ad infinitum. That sounds like a poem. Poetry was the next thing. <laughs> Medicine. <laughs> Influencer yeah. moms. Oh, 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 the poor kids. <laughs> kids are not props. Democracy. I will miss it when it's gone. Last it one. <laughs> Last one because I love watching these debates online about it. Generation X. Oh my goodness. Um oh such simpler such simple times. Um yeah. I, I do think Gen X was like the, the boringest generation, really in retrospect. Is that fair? What, what depends what you what you mean the era was Are, boring or we were the boring ones? Because I don't know. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. Um do you think we had more fun than? Oh yeah, we, because we were we were essentially the last kids who weren't surveilled nonstop. We we were fr I was free, and I remember yeah. bumping into my mom at a bus stop, and I hadn't seen her in two weeks, and I it was just we were free in that era. I don't think any generation is better, but I do think that we were the free. We were free. The last free ones. Yeah. The last ones who were able to just live our our lives as if nobody cared because they genuinely didn't. Do you remember when we were young, people didn't want photos to be taken of them? <laughs> like now, how many photos do you take of yourself in a day? Maybe not you, but people do. <laughs> yeah. 
Doppelganger is the book. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and it's been, I mean, you've had so many uh, bestsellers, so many successes, a professor, documentary filmmaker, all this other stuff. Um, I'm grateful to have been able to spend this time with you and, and being on Strombo's Lit with Apple Books. Do you have the next project lined up, the next thing? Um, it's going to be different. How? It's going to be unexpected. Oh, really? Like a musical theater kind of thing? Like Mean it's Girls? but like you're like that. Really? Something, something. <laughs> it's really nice to see you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, George. This was a treat. Thanks, everyone. I hope you weren't too mean in the comments. Oh, Bye. Bye. <laughs> the wonderful Naomi Klein. That was so, so great. Let me just uh, make sure that everything is clear right there. Um, the Gen X thing I love talking about. By the way, we have our own Gen X camera right here. So if you ever want to, if there's ever anything I need to explain, you know, about where we are today, we can just put it on this Gen X camera. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, Apple Books uh, has been a really lovely partner. I shouted Nick off off the top. Uh, really appreciate working with Nick on this. If you joined us midway through, the whole conversation is going to stay up on YouTube and we'll post it on audio forums as well and on all the social media channels at Strombo. I'm grateful to talk to Naomi. Um, self-reflection, uh, looking at the culture. And the other thing I like about this story, Doppelganger, and the way she approached it, it set out to be maybe playful in one respect, um, but it always goes back to the core, which is if we, if we aren't addressing what's happening in our culture, and look, I'm not your dad, I don't need to tell you how to think, but I just love that. I love that at the very essence of this all, it is still Naomi Klein's core. Um, to care about everyone, regardless of how popular or unpopular it may be. Doppelganger is the book, the most recent one from Naomi Klein. Thanks for hanging with us on Strombo's Lane.